Welcome to A Chat With Heart. I'm your host, Christina Martin. I'm a singer-songwriter. I live on a dirt road with my best friend, Dale, in rural Nova Scotia, Canada. A Chat With Heart is just me having chill conversations with people I want to celebrate and topics that I'm curious about. If you have a question or a comment for this podcast, call my Heartbeat Hotline, 1902-669-4769. To send this podcast even more love, visit me online at patreon.com backslash Christina Martin. I'm so happy you're listening. Our personal stories have great power to heal, influence, and inspire. All we have to do is show up for the conversation. If we just talk about it, we could shut up. Hi there. I hope you're doing well, fighting your good fight. I know some days can feel like a struggle. So when this episode airs, I will either be packing for or on the plane or overseas in England doing a tour with Dale. Um, I'll be sharing things on Instagram and Facebook, but if you want the tour blog, I share that with my paid members on my Patreon. It's kind of my journal. I've always kept a tour journal for myself, but uh, lately I've only been motivated to write a tour journal if I uh, can share it with some folks. So visit my Patreon to keep up with more details on the tour. And my Patreon helps me afford the tour. So soon after I return from England, early April, I'm flying to British Columbia, Canada to do three shows in Vancouver and one on Vancouver Island. And I'm recording a new song with my friend Leroy Stagger at his studio in Victoria. I have a lot to look forward to. Uh, My guest today, I think we met back in 2009, I want to say was very likely my first show in Vancouver, British Columbia. And it was a Songbird North showcase. Songbird North is a bi-monthly showcase presented by the Songwriters Association of Canada and hosted by my guest today, Sherry Ulrich. Sherry has been hosting Songbird North for 28 years. If you're not familiar with the Songwriter Circle, um, this type of event is its a wonderful experience. It's four different songwriters, usually, uh, sometimes less, sometimes more, sharing stories about the songs and the writing. It's really cool. So I'm thrilled to be invited back to do Songbird North in Vancouver on April 4th at the Roundhouse. Get your tickets on my website. It's a stacked lineup. Sherry Ulrich, Jill Barber, Kara Luft, And yours truly. The other solo acoustic shows I'm playing in Vancouver are April 3rd at Faculty Brewing Co. It's their first live music event. I'm so thrilled and looking forward to it. And then y'all know I like doing house concerts, so I'm doing a house concert at Cliffs on April 4th. And then I travel to Vancouver Island to do a show at Char's Landing in Port Alberni going to be my first time at Shars and um, all the ticket information is on my website christinamartin.net y'all I haven't done a solo show since 2009 I think so yeah wish me luck I'm excited I know it'll be good for me just me and my acoustic guitar and my stories you know so that's another fun uh update tour wise and it's only appropriate to chat on my podcast with the woman who is responsible for inviting me to perform in Vancouver she's an icon a strong role model for me for sure for over four decades 
accomplished singer-songwriter and multi-instrumentalist Sherry Ulrich has been winning hearts across North America with her voice, songs, and on-stage charisma. A two-time Juno winner, among other awards, she has recorded 25 albums as a solo artist and with the legendary Pied Pumpkin, the hometown band, UHF, BTU, and the High Bar Gang. Trigger warning, towards the end of the chat, a story is shared that involves sexual violence, which could be triggering for some listeners. Sherry's life is remarkable, and her music has been informed by her experiences. We really just scratched the surface in our chat. I could have talked with her for hours. Thank you, Sherry, for creating a space to build connections with stories and music for audiences and musicians, for sharing your stage, and for being a role model for artists like me. After you listen to our chat, my little heartbeat listeners, do yourselves a favor and listen to Sherry's latest album, Back to Shore. I never regret spending time with Sherry or listening to her music. Sherry, welcome to A Chat With Heart Podcast. I'm so happy. We did it. We did it. We did it. This is so cool to have you. It's such a treat. Um, It's funny. We have such a long history with such a long gap of actually being in the same room, like a couple of decades maybe. Do a lot of people say this about you though? Like I feel as soon as I met you and now, like we have known each other forever. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> We're that's on good. the same page. That's in a that good experience. That yeah. is a good good start. Good start. Yeah. I I'm just so happy and uh even more excited now that I've had some time to kind of dig into your music more and your life. You did some um, Sherry Hall Sherry homework, did you? Yeah, I did. I, don't know I whether mean, to say thank you or apologize. <laughs> Oh, it's fa- it was fascinating, super inspiring, and I love oh. the music videos. Love that you have the like. I'm just so in awe. And but I do, I do want to go back. Like I made some, I made some notes because I'm a little bit of a nerd. And you're a and, pro. Oh well, uh, yeah. We'll, we'll see. You are now. You're officially Thanks. a pro. Thanks. <laughs> or no, you I, have to be paid for it to be a pro. <laughs> no, yeah. Never mind. <laughs> um. Shit. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. No. This is all. Um. This is all, you know what I was, I was laying in my bed last night with Dale, my husband, and uh, I was talking about how great, how, I, how much I enjoy doing these podcast chats. And it's sort of like, you know how we don't really, I don't know if you do, but we don't do photo albums anymore. And so this is such a great way to just document, but like have this piece of like memory with someone I care about and want to know more about. And like when I'm on my deathbed, I legit can just spend time with my friends listening back to these episodes. I'm well, that's why you're I, really planning ahead, aren't you? I have been planning for the end of my life ever since <laughs> my father's death. So yes. Oh, interesting. Which was how many years ago? Oh, it would have been nineteen ninety nine. Which wow. yeah. Which brings me to okay, so okay. Okay. I really want to dig into this and maybe there's not much to dig into, but I, I feel like there might be. Because you you have said that Moving to British Columbia, so you were born in the States, you were born in California, raised in Correct. California, yeah. and then you moved, at some point you end up in British Columbia, Canada, and you had referred to that as kind of an accident, like moving to BC, but I know that it's probably, there's some detail in there, just like when I moved to Austin, oh, Texas, yeah. as a nanny, that was an accident, I didn't know Austin was the live music capital of the world, and I would live there, what is your accident, like what's the detail behind how, well, why'd you cross some, the border? Some of your listeners might have heard this story because I wrote a song called Canada. And so, of course, I have to tell the story of how I came to be here. But it was, I was in Northern California, so uh, just north of San Francisco, so very involved in the anti war movement or the peace movement, depending on how you want to frame it. And uh, very uh, involved in a, in a group on the college campus where I was doing marches. And and my mother was, I was living at home because the college was nearby and my mother was traveling in Europe. And so I was very independent. And Kent State happened 
when mm. the students got shot on a college campus in an anti-war demonstration. And I thought, oh shit, that could be me. I'm, I'm terrified. Like that was the, f I can't say it was the first, but it was a very violent episode in our, in, in my world for sure, yeah. where I felt like I could be the target for something that seemed so right to be supportive of. Right. Yeah. So I decided that very day that I heard that news that I was going to go to Canada, that uh -huh. I was going to leave the country. I did not like what the country was doing and I was going to leave. So I packed up the car, which it was the car that the kids and the family drove. I was the youngest. They were all gone. So I figured somehow that was my car <laughs> and loaded yeah. it up with everything I thought I might possibly need to live in what I thought was a country that had no cities and was just wilderness. So I was prepared to either build a teepee or build a log cabin and homestead. Wow. That's what I thought I was doing. <laughs> I had a friend who lived in, in Vancouver, North Vancouver. So I had somebody saying, you should come here. Um, but I didn't think about where the hell she lived. So I was very surprised when I rolled into Vancouver. But I did feel like it was different from the yeah. very start. I don't know whether it was sort of the monarch vibe, but it felt like better grown-ups were involved and that I wanted to be... I wanted to stay. I mean, I didn't feel like, okay, this is where I'm going to be for the rest of my life. I just thought, oh, well, this is not what I expected, but I'm going to see what's here. Wow. And I had been, I, I had taken violin in grade school and, and um, picked up other instruments along the way, you know, learned the songs of the time and guitar and stuff like that. Um, but I never thought that music was going to be my my thing. But somehow as I settled, and this was after a few years because I lived on a commune in, when I first Ooh, arrived cool. on the coast. There's a lot of stories. I'm going to try Whoa. and keep it short. Um, commune, so that's I, like, that could be a whole episode. I know, I know. So I ended up in Vancouver and going to a lot of music things. And somehow people... Maybe I was sitting in a bit on violin or 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 a conga drum is was the first instrument that I played uh, publicly. Uh, but people started encouraging me to to do music, and then I met some musicians, and they said, "Well, let's start a band." And of course, I had a crush on on the the guy in the band, which was usually how my life's path was led. It was depended ah. on what my boyfriend did, right? So sure. my boyfriend was a guitar player. And guitar maker. Wow. So that's where it started. That's how I ended up in Vancouver and, and never thought of leaving. I did have a chapter of living in Toronto. I had a chapter of living in L.A., but I kept circling back to the Vancouver area and then for 30 years on, on Bowen Island, which is just off Vancouver. So it was pretty, it was pretty easy back then to just cross the border? <laughs> well, it was for just coming to visit. Like I had no problem that first time, but when my boyfriend on the commune, <laughs> when he and I decided, it, actually we hadn't moved to the commune yet. We just decided that we w wanted to. Mm -hmm. And we loaded up his Econoline van with all his lighting equipment because he was a, a lighting guy and got to the border and said, we, we want to immigrate to Canada. And he was a hippie with hair down to his waist. And I don't know what the hell I looked like in those days, but it was most assuredly a hippie vibe. So we remember the the guy who was interviewing us. And this was when you would park and go in, right? And we was yeah. not at the, at the booth. Uh, and he said, what makes you think that we would want your kind here? Ooh. And that was it. So he turned us around. This is a, a lighting guy who went on to to work with David Bowie and Nine Inch Nails, and anyway, in the future. Wow, I would like his, I would like his kind here. <laughs> <laughs> so this was before computers. So we mm. just turned around and we went to a different border and said, "Hi, we're just coming to visit," and drove in. Yeah, and stayed ever since here. And yeah. here you are. Here you yeah. are. <laughs> oh my God, I love it. I love that story. Um, there was an interview that you did where you said that you practice your creativity where you live on Bowen Island in your home, but then where you express yourself is out in the rest of the world. And I don't know why, but it just totally blew me away. I was like, that's such a great way to explain, you know, 
the life of most artists like that live in a rural community. Like we go home, we like solitude and like, I want to chat about the role that solitude uh, plays. So big, so big. Yeah. It's why I'm single. Amazing. <laughs> because I really, I don't even, you know, I'm good with, with my daughter and her husband coming over for a few days or, you know, I love friends to come and visit, but I, I'm ready for them. I'm always ready for people to go as well because yeah. reverting back to that solitude or like when you're on the road and you're billeting with people, like getting to your room, that's your room where you can close the door. It's the best part. <laughs> okay. Maybe the performing is, the music is, but. Oh no, we daydream about yeah. uh, the end of the night, getting to the hotel. I actually don't like, actually, I mean, with a few select friends who get us, I'm not a huge fan of billeting. Oh, I, like, I know. No, no, it's, it, you gotta be on all the time. It's, it's, yeah. I mean, I have made lifelong friends by doing that. Same. And I started out thinking I am never billeting. Don't even think about telling me that's what I'm doing. And then of course had to at, at certain points. And, and as I said, mo uh, there are many of those people who will, uh, who I go to stay with to see because they're, yeah. they're lifelong friends, which is wonderful. But yes, yeah, solitude is, it, it's, I would not be able to be a creative person without it. Having said that, I think either it has f helped foster or it reaffirms that for me, writing is a solo endeavor. And it, and I don't say that proudly because most of the world collaborates and wonderful work comes out of it. Uh, I just, I don't know whether it's that I have sort of a fear of collaboration because it's always been such a private thing for me, the yeah. process. So I have, I will say that I, I write the least amount of time in my house because I have, I, I'm, I'm a home person. I could constant, I could, tw you know, spend a year in my house just puttering. And yeah. fixing things, not that things are broken, but, you know, in home improvement, just painting this and fixing that little hole yeah. there. And, and it's just the way I am. Dusting the so, typewriter that's behind you there. <laughs> do you like organizing? Like, do you like cleaning and doing homey? Yes, like, yeah, I, I love your. I do. I, I think we might be related. Uh, maybe. I think you might be one of my sisters from another What's mother. What's your father's name? Yeah. Robert Joseph Robert Martin. Oh, my God. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. So I go to, I have friends who have a, a cabin over on Vancouver Island that they let me go stay in. So I will go for a couple of weeks if I can. Yeah. Because I, I also need time to, you know, I need a few days to avoid the writing and the creativity. And then yeah. the rest of the time I will surrender to it. Um, I have been home for almost all of January and it's been a, a creative time, which is great. I'm also preparing for tours with three different groups. So it, today is when I start doing that after, after we finish our talk, that's when that work starts. But, but I can do that with nobody in the house listening to me. Yeah. I would, well, I do have a soundproof room I could go to, but. I love it. I love it. And you, you just, you, you know, you've been with in, in a lot of bands. I, my, I'm really curious to hear what kind of bigger life lessons you've learned from being in bands. I, I'm sure that I want a horror story too, but I don't want you to throw anybody under the bus. But like, whatever you can give me, Sherry, because like everything I've learned about everything. <laughs> In the last 50 years has been from being in a band. Yeah. <laughs> Certainly about people and human interaction. Yeah. We, talk, we talked about solitude, but yet you have been in so many bands. So there, it's, it isn't like you, yeah, li you need to live your whole life alone. It's not that at all. It's just no, having that. No. Oh, no. And I think, I think it's about the balance between that and the intensely social experience. Even if I'm touring solo. It's an intensely social experience every yeah. night. It's talking to dozens and dozens of people and, and, um, you know, 
performing in front of them is a social experience as well. But so that I love that balance in life. It's probably one of the reasons why I, I love being home alone, because the, the contrast, the rest of my life, which I enjoy the heck out of, uh, is is very, very people interaction based, very intense mm-hmm. in, in the best of ways, usually in the best of ways. There's the odd time if I've been on the road for a while and there's the odd time where I realize that my inner voice and my outer voice are so different as I'm having a conversation that my inside voice is saying, please stop talking to me. Please stop talking to me. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It can happen. Yes. Uh, but yes, there are, uh, the, the, the dynamics in each band is so different. And of course, because the humans are so different and you go through, especially if like all of the the bands that I've been in by now, except for the Luckies, which is a a female trio, uh, have been together for at least a decade and usually two or three. Well, I've I've been in my own band for 50 years Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) and that involves a rotation of players as well. Yeah. That rotation of players, uh, do you find that, um, you know, are you, are you intentionally going, well, I, are you thinking like, well, I'd like to be around maybe, uh, people of a gener, different generation to freshen things up for me? Or are you just like, if it works musically and they're a cool person, I don't care about age or, uh, any, you know, experience yes. necessarily. Yes, I would say that, but I have loved being in, uh, one of my trios is, is sort of three generational. So it's myself and, and Cindy Fairbank, who's in her forties, I think, and my daughter, or maybe, maybe she's closer to 50 actually. And then my daughter who's in her thirties. So there is that, Oh, I just love it. I love all of it. I mm-hmm. really love all of it. Like it, it, and it doesn't, it doesn't matter about the generation, but I do love it when I look over and realize that, that that's what's happening. We have three generations of women up here and, and aren't they amazing? Yeah. And feeling that sense from the audience of, Oh my God, aren't they amazing? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's that so is great. really cool. Yeah. Yeah. As a, as a career musician, you know that things can get overwhelming. Really? Yes. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Big surprise. It can be overwhelming running, you know, and it is running. You have to be a business person and exactly. there's so many details when it comes to, I mean, that's not even talking about creating the music, but in terms of you want to express it and then, well, how are you going to do that? That's, that's where you start thinking about the business side of things. And, and I, I'm really curious um, because you have, you do have this great, career and experience like what do you think now like simple things what are some simple things that still work when it comes to like building connections um keeping things rolling like what's working for you that oh god you know can kind of like for example do you ever like I, I got on the phone with a couple of promoters uh artistic directors uh in this last month and it was so nice to just talk about like the gig instead of just emailing and I don't well, know. I'm, yeah. I'm torn about that. I mean, it is one of the things that I love is building the connections with presenters wherever I go. Um, and, and I do find that in situations where like one of my bands has an agent and a promoter and management and all of that. So I don't have to do anything, but I feel sometimes that the relationship with the, the presenter suffers because they're only getting that wall of people and noise and demands and stuff like that. So I, sometimes I'll do a little end run and phone them up so that we can have a relationship. Yeah. Um, but I do find that the business side of it, all of that is the part that I dread, Mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. I would rather, other than those relationships that get built, I would rather not be doing all that. And I don't know why I got set on this course. The last time I had a manager was 1982. (laughs) So I've been doing it all myself. And plus with the other trios that I play with, for some reason, because I'm that kind of person, I end up doing the itineraries and the booking and the, and, uh, you know, phoning ahead and arranging everything, all the planning. 
yeah. which everyone is very grateful for. But it does it does suck up my life for yeah. sure. It takes a huge crunch out of the out of my creative life. Um, but you started that question with with a with a little different slant to it, and I lost the thread of what that was. Um, well, because it was the positive part. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't the part about what a pain in the ass it is to have to book yourself all the time. But I guess it was some some tips on, like, yeah, okay. So we acknowledge that this is an, it can be overwhelming, it's consuming, yeah. But what's what's working, and that I suppose if it's you know the things that are working about what we do that keep us going and maybe it is the relationships remember like in your mind and for your so like what are yeah. things that maybe it's something that brings you joy or well the music it's all yeah. about the music i love playing music for people i love it more than ever it just gets bigger and better not in terms of being a bigger star but bigger deeper relationship with the audience with the, when i am with them something very powerful happens mm -hmm. and i love that and I, it's just it's so fun and so positive and so enriching and just to be doing an art form that you in this moment that you are sharing that art form, you are feeling and sensing and seeing mm -hmm. how it's impacting them. And then they express it in the intermission or at the end of the night and or in an email afterwards. And it, it's deep. It's big and yeah. so rewarding that we get to do something that, that affects people in so deeply. So you know what I'm taking from what you just said is – from where I'm sitting, if if you are feeling overwhelmed, listeners, my little heartbeat listeners, I call them, <laughs> and and a lot of them are career musicians or part time, whatever. Like they're they're or, what I'm taking from this is remember what you love and and keep investing in that. Don't don't spend all your time trying to chase, uh, you know, build your t building your team and all these things and networking. It's there is a time and a place for that, but. Ultimately, if you have zero time left to become a better musician, find your joy in your work and your purpose, I guess, and your voice, then you're not going to have anything to connect with. Like, it's going to fall flat. You're, is, am That's I getting that? That's true. Yeah, yes. Except that I've always assumed that if I built a team, mm. then it would free up a lot of time for, for the important part. Um, which is, of course, the creative part, because I distill that down to if I don't write new songs, if I don't keep writing songs, yeah. then I have lost the thread about why I'm doing what I do. If I'm just going out and playing the oh, songs that are, people are familiar with, yeah. but in front of them instead of them listening on their headphones, then that's not enough. Um, but I've just assumed that my failure was not building the team. Ah. But there's something else in there that I think is really important. And it's it's that kernel of why why are you, why are we doing what we're doing? Mm -hmm. And that it's almost a surefire road to despair or unhappiness if one is doing it because they have a deep hole to fill by having some fame, by mm. being known mm -hmm. in that kind of way. And I think, I think that it's important to really have an honest talk with yourself about why are you doing this? Do you need yeah. people to say, oh my God, you're amazing? Do you, do you have a burning need to communicate something or just to create something and then have had enough of a sense that people enjoy receiving that, that you should keep doing it. That's different than, mm -hmm. than I, I really want to be famous or even I really want to be rich, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is even more risky probably. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think that the people who have fame really early on before they have any sense of who they are and why they're doing what they do or want to do what they do, uh, it's a really hard life. It's it's hard in a very different way that none of us who are wildly famous or rich can ever understand. And I, I had enough of it to know that to 
if you can't go out in the world and feel anonymous, if you have people around you, I mean, I never had this much where you'd feel this wave of, oh my God, it's her. It's not like that. I never had that. But I've had enough where someone who might have been an intense fan come up and just be so nervous and so rattled. And I've been that person. I know what that's like. Like, oh my God, they're actually in front of me. What am I going to say? What, can, what uh, uh, How can I impress them? You know, it's just yes. like, I don't want people to feel so out of their bodies and minds. <laughs> when they're around me. So imagine if you are just so crazy famous that that happens, you can't walk out your door with without that sea of of energy of oh my god. Like it would just be so uncomfortable. Yeah. You would have to be so insular and it would change how you move in your life dramatically. So don't think that that's a great goal. <laughs> <laughs> that, right. That's always my advice to to people, and it, it, in workshops and stuff. If I sense that there's a huge amount of uh, a needy ego in there, yes, I'll find a way to try and redirect them or recenter them to really think about why they're doing what they're doing and it, what is it going to give them really. And of course, when you have that hole, nothing fills that hole. That's right. Like it's there for your life until you figure it out that, oh, there's a hole. I better, yeah. I better work on this. That's true. My, my why has, I've identified my whys over the years. It's changed, thankfully. But it's interesting how a why that can be a, a giant hole initially can at least get you started on a path of heart. <laughs> And then yes. recognizing that I no longer want to be fueled by that and how it, you know, changing, which over the years, you know, thankfully and for myself anyway, that my why is, is no longer about the original why. It's a, it's yeah. a, health, a healthier yeah. why. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, my measure of success. I want to know actually what your today, like your measure of, like, Look at yourself and ask yourself, Sherry, what what does success mean to me today? Well, I definitely started out not in the very beginning, because the very beginning was Pie Pumpkin, which was, it so grounded me in the importance of the spirit of the music, because it was a spirited band. Mm -hmm. Like, people would go nuts, and, and it, there was so much freedom in it for me as a musician. <clears throat> so that was... That that really sort of launched me into maintaining that sense of what's important. And then I had, then there was the hometown band, which I joined because of the lure of, oh my God, this, uh, the first tour we were playing to 3,000 seat theaters, two shows a night all across Canada. So that was on Baldy's reputation, right? Yeah. Baldy and the hometown band. And then we became a band after that. So we had a record deal. We had tons of tour support, you know, the touring and buses and all of that stuff. And and then I went solo. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll, Sherry? Uh, I was not the druggie, but there were definitely drugs around. Okay. Um, so... Then I went solo, same thing, record deal, um, lots of support. And I just assumed that that very first album, I was going to be winning a Grammy for that album. There was no question in my mind. Like, this is it. I am, I am launched. Every stage was going to be a 3,000 seat theaters. I, I never really aimed for arenas, frankly. Yeah. yeah. I like You're good like... sound. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and then when, when, uh, so then I moved on to for, so from A and M to MCA, and then the plug was pulled by MCA at the dawn of the U.S. release of my second, sorry, my third album, and. So everything got pulled out from under me. So I I dropped the manager because we never were a good fit. Uh, I I figured okay, I guess. Well, I tried to get another record deal, and and no one was interested. And and I had this this moment where I realized if I want to have a career, I can't be contingent on whether or not a record label thinks that they can make enough money off me, which is what they do. It's a very practical concern. That's why they pick the artists they pick. And I thought, I know that I have fans. I know that there's value in what I do. I know I'm good at what I do. So I'm just going to keep doing it and put the music out myself. I love it. And, and it was triggered initially by 
discovering that that third album that was released in Canada uh, was, remember delete bins? Things would go into the delete bins. So they, they had been taken off the regular market and they were in a warehouse ready to go into the delete bins. And I happened to be in Toronto when the warehouse was in Toronto. So I drove out and picked them up. And I started selling them for $5 a piece at concerts and making wow. money off yeah. the albums, which was the first time I'd done that. <laughs> so that's what set me on the course of, yeah, you can you can put out your own music and you can sell your own music. DIY. I love it. It's a very, I, th I feel like it's a very uh, fulfilling moment when you can have a little tiny five minute break, sit back and go, I you know, I'm not doing this entirely alone. There are people in my life and I have support, but actually I'm an independent, I'm a, my own record label. Like I'm doing yeah, it all. Yeah. I can do all these things and I can communicate directly with my fans and build on a, you know, it might be slower than yeah, with yeah. the machines behind me, but. Um, and, so yeah. as, as you, you asked in the beginning, it, my measure of success now has morphed into what I described before, that I can go in front of an audience, be incredibly comfortable, know mm -hmm. that we're going to have this fantastic evening together. If I'm with other musicians, I feel like, wait till you hear these people play. It's just yeah. so exciting. So all of that. And of course, I would like to be courted by every huge festival around the world. I'd like to be touring in Europe. I would like those things. Yeah. And because I haven't handed off the reins to somebody yet, it might be a little late. <laughs> so um, that's not happening, but I am enjoying the hell out of my life. Oh, that's great. And the music yeah. is getting out there, and I do have an audience, and so it's just I've just scaled it back. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. I have some envy of of peers who are out there doing all those things, and I think, well, can you just take me along? So I, can yes. I open for you? <laughs> I think that's I, normal. I think that's normal, and I mean at the end of the day, sometimes, you know, the fact that you're just doing it, like you're, you're, you are living the creative life and making it work. I mean, the alternative is that you just don't and you get some other, some other job, maybe it brings you joy, but likely not if this is your passion. Um, yeah. And, and that you, you might be miserable. That was always my, like, you're either going <laughs> to, you know, put on your, your big old panties and do the work, or you're not going to get to do this ever. So what's your decision? You know? Right, right. Yeah, that has never, ever, ever been a question for me. But I was very fortunate by going on that first tour with uh, Valdi and the hometown band. And uh, I thank Valdi all the time. He, he never actually says, you're welcome, but I... <laughs> like, for me, because we all, we, as a band on that first huge tour... We just did two songs every night, and one of them was Flying, Fear of Flying, mm -hmm. which was probably the biggest hit. I didn't write it. Uh, Joe Mock wrote it. <clears throat> and so the audience got to know me, and I mm -hmm. got to know the audience in a big way right out of the gate. So I was 20, 27, I guess, 26, yeah. Mm -hmm. I uh, I was watching the Fear of Flying video view um, with the hometown band, I believe, 1977 today. I watched it. I was, you know, what struck me imme immediately was, oh my God, she looks so comfortable on stage. She's so young and comfortable. And your voice was so, just so strong. And I, you know, I mean, I, I'm someone who, I'm taking vocal lessons now. I'm Are middle. You? <laughs> yes. You? With oh M. Griner. Such, oh, yes. Hell, I love him. She's great. And I, um, uh, so before that, I was on my own and, uh, you know, I've had my struggles over the years with just, um, I guess, I, I really just had no idea what I was doing. Like, no consciousness of it was really all by, but uh, because of that, for many, many years, um, you know, struggled with confidence and and um, being on video or any of that. And then seeing a, a beautiful young woman in just, just feeling, looking grounded, I don't know if that was the reality. No, it was, yeah. I, that's how I would have loved to have felt. It's a very challenging thing, especially when you're young, I think. Uh, and just generally, I find the whole element of performance 
kind of odd because we're we're, do, we're playing music because we love music. Mm -hmm. And then we put ourselves in a situation where people watch us do what we love to do. They're, like they're watching us. They're, they're staring. staring at us. <laughs> yeah. And so innately, it's uh, it can be a very self-conscious thing to do. And I'm fascinated by the process of getting to that place where it feels no different than being in your kitchen talking to friends. And it is possible to get there. I, I, I can testify to that. And I think the reason I was able to do it from a young age was because of the pie pumpkin, mm -hmm. because there we were so unselfconscious, and yeah. we were so it was the spirit of the music was so powerful that we never thought about oh my god they're looking at me like that just wasn't in the mix. However, when the hometown band first became a, a, a big touring band. I felt the responsibility as a front person, right? Mm -hmm. And they and there so it was a band of men who weren't necessarily comfortable with me. And they finally came around to saying, Oh, we don't really like the way you present yourself. And I was intensely self-conscious, not playing, but talking. So as a front person, I, it was my responsibility to interact with the audience. And I just, I felt like I didn't have anything to say and that everything I said was going to sound stupid. So it did. And, and, and I didn't feel really supported by the band and it was very uncomfortable. So when, when that band went away and I went solo, even then, I still had a lot of players in the band, but I felt more confident because it was my music. Mm -hmm. And then when I pared it down to just a couple of players, I, I did so partly on purpose so that I would be forced to create a more intimate relationship with the audience mm -hmm. So and really own that place. And, and the biggest thing was realizing that if I took the person I was, which is this person you're talking to, yeah. <laughs> if I took that person on stage, then there was no change. I didn't have to worry about, well, who, who, who am I going to present? What am I going to present? What am That's I going right. to be like? Who am I going to be like? And then it was a breeze. <laughs> It has been ever since. Yeah. What a concept. <laughs> it is. It does take an enormous amount of time for us to figure out that our job is to also be our, I've, I found for what we, for what I do anyway, is, is be yourself. I really, that's what I wanted. How, yes. how can I just be myself and show other people that it's okay to be yourself in all kinds of situations? Yeah. And I, I guess it takes enough interaction with people generally in your life mm. who you feel like they affirm you, they like you, they support you. Yeah. Because it's so easy to go out there and think, are they going to like me? Oh, there's a lot of things that they could not like. Are they mm -hmm. going to see those? Mm -hmm. I get, uh, yeah. So there's, yeah. it takes a while to just integrate all of that and understand that people do like you. <laughs> I, I presume that I like you. So I, I like you. And I also have come around to some kind of acceptance that they're, well, most of the time, if, if people don't like me, they're not going to come to my show. And, or if they learn they don't like me, if they learn they don't like me at my show after this amount of time of doing it and, you know, just being myself, then I probably don't need them at my future shows. You know, if right. it's just not for yeah. them. Like, so yeah. me, I'm not for them. That's fine. Yeah, um, we can't so be. So you everybody. can assume that in that room full of people who have paid money to see yeah. you, that they've done it because they like you. That's right. <laughs> they want to come and see you be yourself, and they want to hear your your music. And and yeah. they all. I don't know why they say this to be honest, but I a lot of people will comment of like uh, I, I'm not. I don't love to make mistakes when performing, but when it happens no. and it does. Often people will be like, and that was so cool when that moment happened. And and they'll say, that was my favorite part. I know. I was like, <laughs> what? I fucking worked hard on all the other I stuff. Know. Jesus. <laughs> all right. Back to the drawing no, board. Right? I, I <laughs> often say that that's why I developed a sense of humor in the first place. Mm. Because as long as the audience is always comfortable, and when you screw up, if you can make light of it, first of all, they think, oh my God, she's human. And second of all, they're so relieved that, that you're not making them uncomfortable about it. Yeah. And even if inside I'm going, oh, for fuck's sake, why did you do that? Or, you know, I have my little inner, inner dialogue <laughs> on the outside, I am making them laugh about it. 
and and they're so grateful. Yeah, I would say uh, for fuck's sake, and then the audience likes that. <laughs> <laughs> but that I I I don't want to say that, but I have at times. Oh yeah, I have. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, oh, she's they're human, whatever. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. Oh my God. And when you talk, talk about things that w one has learned over time. I was in a trio once where the, one of the members, he liked to make people uncomfortable. That was what he felt oh. was part of his job on stage. And that was tricky for me. Like the audience I, or the musicians? The audience. Stage? Well, and then us too, us probably even more than the audience ultimately. And when I finally realized that we were at such cross purposes, I thought, oh, no, this doesn't really work for me. Mm. And I had another uh, person who was an accompanist who told me that he felt like when he played that the audience was there to judge him and he was pissed at them for judging him. I thought, oh, okay, mm. that does not work for me. So I stopped mm. playing with him. Mm -hmm. I had another player who was just always really just kind of dark and uptight and a little bit angry all the time. Mm -hmm. And it took a took about a year of touring with him when I thought, no, nah, it doesn't work for me not anymore. For me. Yeah. Well, on that topic, I, I um I was listening to your song Only the Heart from your album Every oh, Road. Wow, that's a yeah. major one. Great line I'm pulling here. Um I always get this feeling when something is really right or wrong. It's very it was like, oh, it's a clear, beautiful, resonates with me. I get it. It's such a beautiful song. Oh, and wow. I bet, I mean, you just described moments where you're like, I'm going to go with my gut on this. I need to move on. But were there times in your life where you did go against that feeling and really regretted it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I could... This is not a professional story, but I could tell you the moment in my life w that was such a big lesson mm -hmm. to listen to my instincts. Yeah. And please. I don't even know if you want to go here, but. Oh, I do. Uh, it's a chat with heart. <laughs> okay. So uh, I was 30 years old, 1981, um, out on a run on my island, which was a different island, Salt Spring Island. And a fellow came up on a, he, I passed him running up the hill and then he, he came up to me on the other side of the hill on his bike and, and asked, I couldn't quite understand what he was asking me. It sounded like something had fallen off his bike and had he seen it. And anyway, the end result was that, uh, my, my instincts were, this is weird. I don't, I don't want to stop my run. Just, uh, but I, the other voice said, "He's this is a young guy. You should be nice to him. Uh, you should be kind. You should help. Yeah. So I did. And I ended up being grabbed with a knife around my neck and dragged into the bushes and raped. Whoa. And as I finally t ran away, stabbed in the back. So Whoa. my big Whoa. lesson yes. was <laughs> wow, that, I, Sherry. that I learned for a lifetime mm -hmm. is listen to your instincts because my instinct said, this is weird. I'm not comfortable. And as females, we override that all the time because yeah. we are nurturers. We want to be helpful. We want to be kind. Yeah. And it's a hard thing to put into place uh, or, or it, it is a hard thing to override. Um, but uh, it definitely taught me that uh, that voice must always be listened to. I mean, usually the, the repercussions of not listening to it are not quite as dire, <laughs> but sometimes they are. Sometimes, um, I, I, yeah. You just need to remove yourself from, from that situation by listening to that voice. So uh, I've definitely brought that into my well, everything, but it, yeah. it, it has come to play in my professional life that I only want to be on stage with people that I feel love me and support me. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. there are lots of reasons that you pick other people to be on stage with you um, that that are important. I mean, they do have to be good musicians, um, but, but that factor, when I did find in my solo show, shows people for that purpose mm -hmm. um, and, and based on that, or no, I should say when it happened to be those people and I realized how different it was, how different it felt, that how empowering it was to feel like wherever I looked there was support, mm -hmm. I thought I, can, I have to always go for that. Yeah, I love that. I don't love that you had to experience the story that you well, shared. Well, no. <laughs> 
No, but I survived. You did survive, I, yeah. And yeah. I I am not so sorry because it I had had a fear about it for years. It's one mm -hmm. of the reasons I moved to the island and moved out of the city. Um, but I also, but part of that fear was how would I ever cope in that moment? Mm -hmm. How would I survive in that moment? And I survived by by going directly to try to get to the heart of that person. And, and instinctively, I just started talking. Yeah. I talked and I and asked questions and I I humanized myself. Mm -hmm. And that's what my instincts told me to do. And that was, you know, I didn't lose my life. Uh, I, I did not have uh, lifelong emotional scars from it because I was old enough and had had enough experience in life to know how to how to process it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's made me a stronger, better person. You are strong. Yeah. This, it's also yeah. probably informed your music, your writing, your topics, your... Well, I have written a couple songs about it, <laughs> but just a couple, not as many as I have about divorce, but... <laughs> hey, there's another great topic. Hey, well, you know, you, to get to the good stuff in life, you have to, I guess, sometimes... I, I mean, I uh, my recent album, Storm, is not about loving the metaphorical storms in my life, but... <laughs> about being having at least some appreciation for who I am today um, because of the hardships and because of the loss, because of the trauma. And, and how you managed it. How you could, yeah, how you got up after the fall. And, uh, yeah. and, and yeah, so an appreciation and a gratitude and, and a thankful, you know, for that, but not yes. loving the things that happened, which <laughs> yeah, I yeah. think. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, and never wanting them to happen again. That's right. <laughs> well, yeah, totally. My spider sense is from a, a young, you know, girl that I developed as a, um, because of my trauma. Um, they helped me keep me safe later in life. I mean, there's no denying yes. it. And maybe yeah. I was over, and I'm an over analytical person, but also that's also to my benefit sometimes too, right? Like, yeah. So, yeah, eh, I'll take it. I'll take me. You know. <laughs> Exactly. I'll take yeah. you. Um, and then you take take that person on stage. That's right. <laughs> it's a huge yeah. hit. <laughs> it's a work in progress. It's a work in progress. Speaking of taking the stage, I'm excited. Uh, we're going to put this episode out soon because uh, I do want to let people know that we are going to be on the same stage together. Yes, soon. finally. I'm so grateful yes. to you for this. Thank you. And so this Songbird North. This is a this is a series that you have really given wings to for when how long have you been doing this? I think it's good. I think this is year 28 coming up. That's a fucking incredible. Yeah, I've not done anything is. for 28 years other than exercise. <laughs> I don't think I've committed to it. Yeah, it's incredible. I've been walking for 28 years. Yeah. Um Yes, it's quite amazing. I certainly didn't start out intending it to be so long lasting. And it I, I don't know how much longer it'll last because there's a lot of changes at the Songwriters Association of Canada. But I I, I did decide when I thought they were going to pull the plug before 2024 mm -hmm. that I would carry it on anyway, even though I'd been kind of hoping like, okay, I'm kind of tired of doing this. I'm tired of organizing it. Sure, I'm not tired of the event, yeah. just like everything else in music. Uh, yeah. But it has been a fantastic experience to create a, a stage um, four or five times a year with four different writers. That includes me as the host. I don't often do as many songs as the other writers because I figure the audience has seen plenty of me. Um, and put together uh, this un a, a, a com combination of people who normally would not be sharing a stage and experiencing the alchemy that happens as a result of that. It's going to, it's unlike any other evening yeah. in their lives, in our lives for the audience. And it's, yeah, it's a wonderful thing to be able to, to uh, offer that kind of opportunity up for both the audience and the writers. I'm pumped. Like I, I don't, go out west much and the reason i'm going is because of this and i'm ha it was a no-brainer when i was like well this is 
This I will go. I will go for. And yeah, listen, I don't want to take, well, I do want to take all your time, but I'm not going to. Um, <laughs> I've already taken enough. But I have this goodbye that I, I write out because I, I'll fuck it up if I don't read it. Um, I have like we're, a little We're goodbye. finishing? We're, we're done? Done? We, well, no, no, we don't have to. Just, but we have to, we have to have like, we have <laughs> I just to. just got here. <laughs> listen, I like came to your house. We can stay. And we haven't even eaten yet. <laughs> you have to go walk. You got it. Your fax machine was uh, buzzing. I you got like, a no. lot of rehearsing to do. That's yeah, you got to sure. rehearse. And um, no, no, no. Well, first of all, before I read my goodbye, because we do have to have like a something at the end and I like to gush about you for a second. But uh, I was checking on your Spotify. You know how you can look at, at the part? Uh, there's a section that's like, you might also like these artists. Oh, and okay. I don't know if you have any idea who is on no that idea. list. No, okay. no these idea. Three real heavy hitters. Are you ready for this? Yeah. Christine McPhee. Yeah. Bee Gees. <laughs> that a surprise. Yeah. yeah. And get this, ABBA. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> I was really impressed. Oh I would God. love to have that the, under my Spotify. Is that, it? is that the list? There were more. There was like um, a deep dive into 70s pop. There was like a, like a playlist. Oh, wow. And oh my uh, God. you should check it out. Check it I out. Should. Yeah. But I, I the reason I, when you said Christine McPhee, I was thinking of the McPhee that is married to David Foster and, uh, for a oh. second. It took I was me a while like, to compute who like, that was. It doesn't seem like Sherry cares about this comparison or knows <laughs> Christine no, McPhee. It just took me a second. That's okay. Oh, that's, that's okay. funny. Um, okay, you, I'm going to read you my little goodbye statement. It's going to sound romantic, but I'm not hitting okay. on you. Or Before you do, oh, yeah? I have a question for you. Oh, yeah, sure. Do I have vocal fry? Vocal do, fry? Have you noticed that? Do you know what vocal fry is? I know guy oh, a lot. Um, I mean, um, I, yeah, there's a little, like, um, ah, I mean, it's not anything, it doesn't sound bad uh, or anything. But I, think I don't know. I, I heard an interview recently where I heard it. I, I, I hate it in other people. So mm. I, when I heard it in myself, I was horrified. And of course, I have not thought about it through the, in this entire interview to try and avoid it. But okay, carry okay, on but, with your goodbye. Okay, but it's not, it's not like a wild level of, okay, I good. just heard like a nice little, there's like a little raspiness a little at times, growl. Okay, but it's early and you <laughs> slept in <laughs> and you were coughing. So all those things are really hard on your vocals. Uh, right. Uh, right. Tell you right. what, okay. next time you do an interview, okay. just guzzle um, castor oil. Or, or no, wait. Uh, <laughs> like, like just lubricate your throat. Lube up. <laughs> no. Oh, my God. Okay. 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 Uh, okay. I re I'm reading it. Like it's okay. Fine. That's fine. Goodbye. <laughs> there's, there's more. Well done. <laughs> there's more. <laughs> Sherry, from the moment I met you, it felt like I'd always known you. I am in awe of your genuine and quality voice, your skills on multiple instruments, your songwriting, as it resonates with me and inspires me. Thank you for inviting me to share your audience in Vancouver at Songbird North multiple times now, and for always responding to my emails over many, many years. It is an absolute privilege and a pleasure to get to know you more. I can't wait to see you and hear your music again live. You are a Canadian gem, an icon, a kind and generous human. Stay awesome and let me know if you need me for anything. Thank you. Aww. We did it. We did it. <laughs> And that's how you end your podcast. It's love. I don't want to say goodbye to you. Oh, I don't want to say goodbye to you. Welcome to the Heartbeat Hotline. One nine zero two six six nine four seven six nine. I'm the host of a Chat with Heart podcast, Christina Martin, and I'm so excited you called. Leave me your question, a suggestion for the podcast, or a comment about this episode. Please be aware your message may be used on the podcast and social media. Tell me your name, where you're calling from, and it's also fine if you want to remain anonymous. Thanks for listening. 
Have a great fucking day. Thanks for listening to A Chat With Heart Podcast, produced by me, Christina Martin. Co-produced and engineered by my husband, Dale Murray. Dale's a stellar singer-songwriter and music producer, so check out his website, dalemurray.ca. The podcast theme song, Talk About It, and I Don't Want to Say Goodbye to You, were written by me and recorded by Dale. Visit my band camp to find uh, CDs, vinyl, digital music, and fun merch like custom-made puzzles and temporary tattoo packs. Become a monthly or yearly supporter of this podcast and my music endeavors on Patreon. If you're new to Patreon, it's a membership platform that helps creators get paid. I love it. Sign up as a free or paid member at patreon.com backslash Christina Martin. I would love it if you had time to share, rate, leave a review, and subscribe to A Chat With Heart on all the places you listen to podcasts. Wishing you, my little heartbeat listeners, a great day.